way and you're not doing it intentionally it's yes. because you have been conditioned yourself for such a long time through this person so, who's dominant before and then we have a similar reaction if a person has a similar pattern right Exactly. So it triggers us what is already in there. However, not everything is lost. We can change. Mm -hmm. We can change at any age. But your brain is like a map, a reflection mm -hmm. of, of your life. So the brain is neuroplastic. It means it can create new connections. It can prune connections. It can connect in new ways. We, learning is creating new connections. Remembering is maintaining that connections. And that's why anatomically, our brain is designed for change. Um, there is an association between creativity, insight, innovation, and your brainwave. And you can learn to create that conditions. So this huh. is why we, this is one thing we do in the with neurochain solutions. Yeah. We train that is perfect to introduction to your perspective. Yeah. Let's exactly let us dive in. So Welcome to the Power Minds channel, your go-to channel for meeting inspirational people. And today it is my great pleasure to welcome Maria Lisa, who is such an inspiring person. Very warm welcome to you. Hi, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm really excited to be here today with you. And I'm very happy that you're on the Power Minds channel. And Maria Luisa is here to share with us a really important uh Question, first of all, and a, and a really, really inspiring answer. So the question is a question that almost every one of us asks himself or herself during the working life, at least once <laughs> in, you know, our career, which is how to actually create lasting and desirable, desirable change at work from the inside out. And the perspective that Maria Luisa is going to uh, share with us is actually a perspective from um, emotion management, if I have uh, understood correctly. And it's called Neuro Change Solutions Perspective. So I'm really looking forward to that, to learning more about that. But first of all, let us introduce Maria Luisa. Uh, Maria Luisa has a long, long background. You are, uh, you work l many years in corporate life as a, uh, you were a senior finance and tax um, expert. And now, actually, you have your own business. You are a resilient, resilience coach, sorry, and a neuro change solutions consultant. And I'm going to link in, obviously, also your, your independent uh, company. Now, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about you as a person, first of all? What is inspiring you in your life? Who is, for example, an inspiring person for you? Many, but I think one that impacted uh, myself a lot was Nan Nando Parrado. And Nando Parrado, uh, maybe you don't know about him, but he was one of the survivors of a uh, flight uh, accident uh, in 1972 in, in, the, and in the Andes. Uh, it was a near Uruguayan um, machine, and they, they survived 75 days. Uh, oh, and wow. Nando Parrado, with another um, um, of the, of the uh, one friend, uh, they really walk three days. Uh, they cross the mountains until they, they found help, and then the other ones uh, could be rescued. And the most impacting thing about Nando Parrado is that he's a very humble person. He's, uh, he developed a sense of gratitude for life and uh, he is a successful business owner and he says now it's so easy to make decisions because there's no decision that was harder than the decision they took and the decision they took and that mountains was to decide the way they wanted to die because it was sure that they were going to die. Oh they decided they wanted to die, they wanted to die walking. So okay. That, so, yeah. So and and I I and they they were safe and this this sense of gratitude for life is something that is a big teacher for me because we tend to forget that how much we have. And as this, he's very very him is very easy to make decisions because no decision can be more difficult than the decisions oh, that take yes. there. Everything so, was relative for him, I guess so. No, so really he wrote true. a book about this ex this amazing life experience, or is there anything that we can link for the viewers? There is uh, there is uh, his page. There are books, and there are many speeches of him in YouTube, so we can link. Uh, oh, great! Because he yeah, that is really, so inspiring. Yeah, it's really for me a, a very impacting personality and uh, a teacher. 
ah, oh, yes, teacher for life as well. I mean, if you survive that kind of experience, you can do anything, I believe. <laughs> That is exactly. well. It reminds us that we can uh, that it's to take things a little bit more easier than we usually do, and to always yeah to to put things relative. So do I really have to get involved into that problem emotionally that much, or is it actually rather small? <laughs> okay, and the next personal question: What is your one book recommendations to the viewers? Where you say read that because this is so important; it changes your life. Yes, one of the, I think the one that impacted me more, I was reading this at a very young age, I think I was 11, was The Lord of the Rings and uh, the works of, uh, of, of Tolkien and also Silmarillion, which is the background work for The Lord of the Rings. Uh, what was impacting me is, of course, this is fiction and this is fantasy. I, I, I was lost in that world of imagination, but I think the lesson for me was that it's about someone ordinary making extraordinary things which is a simple hobbit which could be you and me and uh, yes. no, nothing spectacular about us but everybody has the potential to do something really extraordinary we just have yes. to believe it's possible we just need a little bit of uh uh, you know, to so believe in ourselves and then it's possible and it's a good reminder to practice this every day. The thing that, that was very nice. Yeah, that is very nice actually. It's very <laughs> inspiring because we are not actually why do we classify ourselves always in this ordinary, extraordinary? We are all extraordinary, aren't we? <laughs> exactly. We are all unique and extraordinary, and we need to, I think, uh, discover that talents that we have that everybody has in different way there are not two persons that are equal and how to leave that talent how can you develop that and and uh, I think this is one thing that, that we owe to ourselves to explore that talent to our life uh, as well because we only have yeah. one life so yeah we should explore definitely <laughs> our talents and thank you for that um also in in our times I just want to go back to what you just said because let me just underline because we're so now concerned in companies about diversity and respecting diversity what you just said is important for that because how can we not I mean we, we should value our single and extraordinary talents to actually learn to respect more everyone is different and that that difference brings so much to the working world as well Exactly. Yeah, you, I mean, you're touching such an important point. We're becoming more global. We have uh, remote teams working in different parts in the world. We have to leverage on that capacity that comes from diversity. The problem is you need to set the right environment for that yeah. talent to flourish. So one of the things that uh, companies are talking a lot about is psychological safety. Uh, and how to create that condition. So one condition is inclusion. Everybody has to feel included. So it's not just about making that policies, but you have to create the conditions so that people really feel included, which is, by the way, a basic human need and right, yeah. the right to be included. So that's why we thing. don't where we don't feel like we belong. We cannot possibly work. Can't can we? <laughs> It's yeah. it sounds like a no brainer, but it's actually not. And as you say, it's so important, and it's so at the same time, it's so difficult to do, right? I mean, yes, I mean there are a lot of initiatives already going on, uh, but we quite not understand exactly the reasons why sometimes we exclude subconsciously. So what ha happens is when we in don't include, we create a lot of stress in the environment. So and this triggers some emotions, and I think we will talk about this in a moment. Yes, because this is counterproductive to uh, a productivity focus and collaboration exactly and also if i may add it's underrated emotions are still so underrated at the workplace but it actually makes up most part of our day how we feel actually <laughs> that's <laughs> my little addition and then yes. uh, also um question to you what is your one tool that you could not work without that you could not live without where you say even on a lonely island i have to have this tool with me so one of the things i practice a lot is before i start my day is okay very quiet and what is what i would like to achieve today mm -hmm. and i have my to do's. what is most important what is urgent uh not to just jump in reacting to that mail or that uh 
seem to be urgent things, maybe urgent for other people, but not for me. So <laughs> try to be a little bit more selective on that. And uh, I take some, when I feel, okay, I need made a, not a, now a break. Uh, consciously breathing is one nice. thing that sits me down. And it doesn't take a long time. So you just need a couple of minutes just to breathe in and ask yourself, how am I doing right now? Hmm. Uh, Okay. It's like what a is... self-check, right? It's a self kind of, you You check in with yourself in the morning kind of thing. Exactly, exactly. Because otherwise, if you don't check in that moment, you're going to take this with you the whole day and probably mm -hmm. you will sleep with that um, emotions at night. So you yeah. will maybe uh, be thinking about, and uh, this is not good for um, mm. uh, our sleep, for our regeneration. So this is one thing I, I usually do when I really notice, oh, I think I need a break. So let's take mm -hmm. that break. It's a good investment. Yes, the breaks and also the conscious thinking about breaks and uh, to actually reflect on it, as you say, to really consciously ask yourself, you're in a dialogue with yourself. You ask yourself, how do I feel? <laughs> that is very, yes. very good. Yes, we don't do this usually because we jump from one thing to the other, to the yes. other, to the other. <laughs> Especially in corporate life, if I may say, <laughs> it's the whole yeah. day is structured. The whole day we're jumping and next meeting, and since Corona, the next video call, and we have to learn to take breaks seriously. It's really um, definitely absolutely. <clears throat> you know, because you said about breaks, there is a very recent uh, recent Microsoft study um, about back to back meetings. So they compare ah. people who are doing back to back meetings. In Microsoft and another group of people that like, were having breaks of five minutes in between and they were measuring brainwave activity. Ah. And in the first group without without breaks, they measure after the fourth break, they had high beta brainwave activity. High beta is associated with high levels of stress. Ah, in the other group, is so interesting. Wow. Yeah. In the other group, there's a photo with the brain scans. In the other group, just five minutes contribute to remain with low uh, brain frequency. So uh, about low beta and alpha, which is more the creative state. So it really makes a difference to take that five minutes. So the low beta and alpha, you said that is, uh, if you have lower of that, you are more in a creative state. Yes, there is, right. um, there is an association between creativity, insight, innovation, and your brain wave. And you can learn to create that conditions. So this oh. is why we, this is one thing we do in the with neurochain solutions. Yeah, we train that is perfect change. introduction to your perspective. <laughs> let's, exactly, let us dive in. So tell us more about this um, fascinating perspective. So it's called neurochange solutions perspective. And can you just dive in there? So these brain waves, what do they tell us about ourselves? Yes. Okay. I have to go a little bit back to uh, connect with the brain waves. So the um, Neurochain Solutions is uh, a company uh, being uh, founded by Dr. Joe Dispenza, which is a brain researcher, which is a best-selling author and has developed models for change mm -hmm. based on uh, neuroscience and physiology. So, and what Neurochange does, it brings this work, his work to the corporate world. So oh. and he has a program and it, yeah, this is the program I deliver is called Change Your Mind, Create New Results. So which oh. is a really, uh, it's a, it really, it really uh, does what it says. So mm -hmm. we teach people a formula, a very simple process and approach to help them design the changes they want to make in their life and to make them sustainable. Oh. And this involves, it is very simple, uh, this involves, first of all, checking um, who I am now, what, who do I no longer want to be, and who do mm -hmm. I want to be, how do I want to be, So, which is the most difficult part. And uh, in this process, we talk about the three brains. Um, but the basic idea is that in this work, the personality is made on how people think, how people act, and how people feel. Mm -hmm. And this is a product of our past experiences and our conditioning mm -hmm. of what we have learned. There are many, many, many influences that we have there. So because we repeat, we learn by repetition, we create habits of thought, action and feeling that we perpetrate in time. And this 
creates our personality. And that's yes. why we do things the way we do. That's why when we feel written, we respond the way we do. And everybody does it in a different way. Mm -hmm. So the problem, the problem, so when we need, when we really want to change something, uh, most people, um, maybe I have to go back. If the personality is made of how we think, act, and feel, this mm -hmm. perception creates our personal reality, which is our life. It's the yes. way we perceive life. So from this point, we operate and we uh, filter everything that we... It's our filter, uh, exactly. It creates a filter. Our filter. Exactly. And the so filter judges as well, if I may just jump in there, sorry. Uh, th this filter actually is a judgmental filter, isn't it? Because it puts, the filter puts a certain way how we perceive it. We even perceive, we even perceive things as good and bad, right? Through the filter. Exactly. Yeah. It is, uh, it is um, yeah, it's not just judgmental. It can be also a, a filter the way, the way we feel. For example, you have a dominant mother and you, feel, you ah. find someone a dominant uh, boss at work, for example, a mother that mm -hmm. reminds you to your mother, you may react the same way. And you're not doing it intentionally. It's yes. because you have been conditioned yourself for such a long time. Through this so, person who's dominant before. And then we have a similar reaction if a person has a similar pattern, right? Exactly. So it triggers us what is already in there. However, not everything is lost. We can change. Mm -hmm. We can change at any age. We can change habits, and everybody has changed some habit in 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 uh, in his life. So people stop smoking, people stop eating chocolate, and more more difficult things. Now, um, in order for us to change, we need to start thinking, acting, and feeling differently. Yes. So we need to change our personality, and nothing happens until we change. And some people change their job, they change the company, but they don't truly change. They change mm -hmm. the environment, but they continue thinking, acting, and feeling the same way. And this is the basic principle we teach. Now, the point is, how do we do it? What, do, what does so it take? May I just ask, just because you said very one very interesting sentence, you said it is actually possible to change your personality. Now, you know there's a received wisdom out there. The received wisdom is, I've heard that thousands of times, that the basis, the fundament of the personality cannot be changed. So this perspective actually says the contrary, right? It says you can change from the inside out. Yes, but we are. We have to, have to be very careful on the definition we give about the personality. Yes. There are many, many definitions of, per, of personality. What we say here is that in our work, mm -hmm. the personality is defined on the way how we think, how we act, and yeah. how we feel. That and aspect, this is what yeah. We change. yeah. So we have to really very be careful with the, with the definitions mm -hmm. of personality. So we are talking about our definition of personality. Yes, yes. So that yeah. is the filter you were talking about, how we act, how we feel, and what was the third one? How we, how we think, how we act, and how we feel. Yeah. Yeah. So the thinking, the actions, the daily actions and the daily feelings, that is actually what you are saying. This can be changed. It's not it's nothing that is static for your whole of your life. No, not necessarily. The brain uh, research has shown since many years that our brain is neuroplastic. So mm -hmm. everything that we have experienced in our life, every mm -hmm. memory, every habit we have been learning is hardwired physically anatomically in your brain so oh. you have to shape it in your brain so that everything is like that your brain is like a map a reflection mm -hmm. of of your life so the brain is neuroplastic it means it can create new connections it can prune connections it can connect in new ways we learning is creating new connections remembering is maintaining that connections and that's why anatomically our brain is designed for change. That's that how is, we adapt. What you just said, that is so powerful because actually, can I just add something that I read recently that fits nicely? I read something about teenagehood, <laughs> about teenagers. I don't know why I have a teenager. So, um, and it said that during teenage years, the brain is being completely restructured. Now, would you agree with that? I mean, uh, obviously, that was an article talking about the, I don't know what is going on in our brains during teenagehood, but this would actually fit into what you're saying, right? That if your personality changes, that means also in the brain, there's rewiring going on. There's rewiring all the time. Yeah, especially, of course, when we are when we are babies. 
this uh, it because the brain grows is the organ that stop growing the latest i think it stops about the age of 25 huh. um, That's interesting yeah well. especially especially one part which is called the frontal lobe which mm -hmm. is one part of the nerve is right behind the, the forehead and one of the big, very important functions of the frontal lobe, uh, by the way, his nickname is the CEO of the brain. Ah. Because, yeah. <laughs> <Very nice. laughs> because, you know, because it's the seat for uh, decision making, for innovation, for conscious awareness, for emotion mm -hmm. regulation. Now, in teenagers, the frontal lobe is not completely developed yet. And this, uh -huh. if this is the center of emotion regulation, that's mm -hmm. the reason why. They need to learn first to control their emotions. Sometimes they are very reactive. They don't have the beloved the full capacity of the frontal lobe yet. So it's for for parents to be a little bit more patient. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Ta Can we have some music quickly? <laughs> yeah, I will exactly. try my patience. Exactly. <laughs> now, but, but also, that actually explains that explains what you're just saying. That explains the whole phenomenon because they are maturing in that part of the brain. This this is the maturing process, right? The the adolescence years. Exactly, and and it doesn't stop there. So our brain is neuroplastic the whole life also in late ages. However, this neuroplasticity capability uh, mm -hmm. diminishes with age. So uh -huh. it's correlating with age. However, there are people in their 70s uh, starting new hobbies and uh, really uh, studying at the university. So it's possible. But of yes. course, there's a negative correlation with a positive correlation with the age in decreasing neuroplasticity. Yeah, that's okay, also but true. That is the neuroplasticity of the brain which explains that change of that personality what you just described of that thinking acting and feeling about it can be changed the whole life through so that alone is for me already a very uh, enriching perspective because it answers the the, the the general question can i actually change and the, the answer is yes and if you say so you said it, it's also desirable sustainable change can you um explain a little bit more about that what do we call a desirable change yes desirable is one you want one change you choose mm -hmm. to make so there are and that is important things. isn't it because sometimes people say oh you have to change but it, it shouldn't be an exterior influence that is what you're arguing right you're saying exactly. it has to come from within yourself Yes, yes. And this is, I think, one one type of change that is becoming more relevant. So there are two kinds, how I call, I two, two kinds of changes. The first one are the changes that are imposed mm -hmm. uh, from the environment, a company restructuration, uh, mm -hmm. uh, a layoff, for example, uh, the weather, the pandemic, traffic jams. There are things you really cannot do anything about. Well, you can do something. You cannot change, but you can change the way it affects you. Yes. So you have a choice there. Um, so this is one thing. But then we have the other changes that are the ones that you choose to make. For example, going into vacation to uh, the Caribbean uh, uh, Sea. This is one change you want to do. It's when it, one decision to do something. This is a change. Or you change a job because you want to make that change. So mm. these are the ones. Now, Everything is fine and easy as long as it doesn't compromise your personality. Hmm. So the problem that the problem comes when this change is only possible with a different way of thinking, acting, and feeling. Because then okay. you have to change habits yes. of behaviors. And this is where people struggle. I give you a very uh, uh, good example, which is uh, the New Year resolution. Hmm. Everybody has <laughs> your, your now it gets but interesting. Now I'm go, going to the gym, getting in shape. Yeah, you say already in September, I start next year. Yes, so, <laughs> so in January, you, you, uh, you, uh, you go to the gym, yeah, you pay for the whole year or whatever. You start going the first week, and the second week, you say, Ah, it's raining today, today is not a good day. Hmm. I will go tomorrow. I uh, so you start, and what what is happening there exactly? So you're thinking, yes, I'm going to go to the gym. So you have the best intentions, but your body has mm -hmm. not been making sports for two years. Your body is saying, no, no, I don't believe you. Uh, we're going to stay here sitting in the sofa. So why why is this? Because thoughts, actions, and feelings are not aligned. Hmm. 
So it requires an alignment of thoughts, actions, and feelings, which means a change in your personality. And this is the part that is affordable. So to stand up and to move your body and to change the emotional state of your body. The so emotional in other words, state of your body, that is interesting. Uh, that is possibly a, a way that many of us have not thought about it. So our body can be in an emotional state. And it. how would you explain that? Can you, can you um, explain it a bit more? Because I find that very interesting to think about our body in terms of an emotion. Yes, yes. And it's, it's interesting because... Um, you have been, let's say, somebody that didn't ma never made the sport in the whole life. No, you have been conditioning your body um, to certain emotions, mm. and because okay, you, you say okay, I'm a person that uh, is comfortable, wants to be at home. So every emotion you experience, even the quiet ones, now we, we know the big ones. We know enthusiasm and joy and and sadness. But mm -hmm. what about the the more quiet? ones worry and uh, indifference they are also there now what you're doing is there is a consistency in thought action and feeling so you think mm -hmm. you're not going to the gym you're not going to the gym the result is you stay at home and this creates an emotion a chemical cocktail in your body that is exactly aligning to that thought and feeling mm -hmm. so everything is aligned now imagine now one day first of january you have that wonderful wonderful thought brilliant idea to go to the gym hmm. so your thought is not not anymore in alignment with the old personality yes so it creates disruption mm -hmm. you have to realize also actions and feelings so it's like when you're breaking a habit you're being smoking for 20 years one day you stop smoking your body's craving for that for the cigarette yeah, exactly because you it's linked to emotions everything. Yeah, exactly. You have been also, yeah, exactly. So you have to change the chemical continuity. The chemical continuity was okay before, and now you broke it and you have to restore it, but in a different way. So the viewers, I mean, I can hear the viewers now. The next question will be, yeah, but how? <laughs> how can I do that? Because uh, that is a very nice way of actually also understanding it, because it's true. Whatever I have already associated with my past personality as negative, in the next situation, I will re-perceive it as negative. But how can I? I cannot force myself to perceive it as positive. Can I? <laughs> or how do you? What do you, you advise? Try, you can try. Yeah, the first thing you do is to uh, to uh, pay a little bit attention to what are you doing, mm -hmm. what are your triggers, what are your stress factors, who do you no longer want to be. So you mm -hmm. have, for example, a, a smoker has to become aware that I don't want to smoke anymore, and this is the oh, easy. Yeah? Yes, so the, the first, first of all, to see yourself. Yeah. Okay. You have to know it first. You have these things that are subconscious. You have to pay attention to them. To become aware of those things so this is the first step become aware of who you no longer want to be the next so it starts with the identity thing. doesn't it it's it's your identity actually in terms of who am i who what who do i want to be first of all who do i want to perceive myself to be and who do i want other people to perceive me as right this is yes, uh, I will start with myself. Yes, it's like an inventory of yourself. You know, it's like mm -hmm. an inventory of yourself. How am I really thinking, acting, and feeling? What do I don't like about myself? Mm -hmm. So, in the next step, in the next step is you still don't know how you want to be, but you yeah. you know who you don't want to be, which is so creating some awareness of what was not uh, you mm -hmm. were not aware before. So this is the first one. Um, then you start designing your future self. And this can be applied to any business context. Because I we love that expression, design your future self. My God, that is so powerful. Can you just, we need to, that is going to be the headline, <laughs> design your future self. Be, but that is true. It is possible. You can think about yourself in a different way. You don't have to carry on, you know, like uh, in the in the past, people used to say, no, I actually... Um, my life was uh, the destiny leads me to I need to be my whole life I need to work as a as a as a hairdresser let's say you know and it's the destiny so I am a hairdresser I will be a hairdresser and probably my children will work in that line as well and that is actually exactly the contrary isn't it because what you just said is so so uh, powerful it's actually teaching us to say no you can completely redesign what you want to be and who you want to be 
Yeah, and this is one thing we never learned this at school. Yeah, we are. Oh being, yeah, definitely not. <laughs> so this is one thing, and I I'm convinced. Well, this is my personal opinion, but this is what I see with the um, artificial intelligence and all the jobs that are going to disappear in the next years. Um, what are the jobs that are being demanded? So mm -hmm. one of the first ones is critical thinking, creativity, decision making, innovation, um, emotional intelligence. One of our big ones, which are skills that are human that you cannot really program yet in a machine because we don't fully understand them hmm. so uh, yes yeah so this is one of the things that when we need to learn how to develop those skills and we need to teach people to develop those skills yes it's and actually something that you cannot just um, be born and know how to do it's something it's really a skill as you say yeah yes I mean, we know how to uh, learn to be a, a profession, mm. which is a kind of a collection of tasks that you do automatically. But lawyers, for example, and ninety percent mm -hmm. of what they do is going to be automized and 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 being done with artificial intelligence. Most mm -hmm. of the so that human skills are the ones uh, of the future in the next years. So we need to help people to develop those skills. How do I? think critically for example how yes. am i how can i be more creative that kind mm -hmm. of things and, and that uh, can be, as you say part of your personality that you decide or design yourself and that is something that really can come just from yourself you don't need a second person in terms of that decision i want to say of course i agree with you it has to be taught but the decision to do it to change it that is yourself yeah, and in a business context, uh, so we can talk about changes at the private level, you know, which is easier. Um, mm -hmm. I want to start a new sport and uh, I want to learn uh, piano playing, which is easy. But the challenge was it comes when it comes to shared goals in a team, for ah, example. Yes. That is which, collaboration, yes. <laughs> and only by changing the culture of a company, of a whole company. A culture of the company is the personality of the company. Mm -hmm. It's how the company thinks, acts, and feels. So because yes. it's the sum of the people. So so everything that we're talking about here, it applies also to any organization because it's and made of group. people. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So the point is, how do you help people to mm -hmm. internalize the goal and really want to become that person that achieves that goal as a mm -hmm. collective? This is, I think this science to teach people this way i think this is one thing uh the future is demanding to yeah do. it's it's a future uh, thing and it's also a very important one because as you just outlined it will be demanded even more it's an in-demand thing because as you said now there's new there's changes coming up there's ai rising there's changing in the workplace there's going to be lots of organizations in the way in which they're organized now don't make sense in the future anymore. And so that what you just described to, to teach that skill of adapting rapidly as a group, as an organization will be so much in demand. Actually, as you say, we should even include it in general education, shouldn't we? Because it's that adaptability, isn't it, to new circumstances? Exactly. Exactly. It's by the way, our natural ability uh, children have this much more. They are more creative, but with the process of education and socialization, we um, reduce that amount of possibility. We start, we, they stop thinking in such a creative way. There, there are yes. studies about this. Ah, so our uh, general education system at the moment. Yeah, exactly. I would have uh, would have asked you. That would have been my next question. It doesn't foster it at the moment, does it? Because if you say we need to teach it more, the actual current education system totally ignores that part of ourselves so we have that in ourselves but it's not it's not um underlined it's not fostered it's not uh children are not taught yeah that it's a good skill people are not even aware of it that they have it <laughs> no i think one of the things uh, a school should teach much more is how to select information the information is everywhere and uh, i i mean you have uh you have uh, heard about a chat gtp uh, that uh, that uh, everybody can write it text i mean artificial intelligence described the, the text so really we have information is everywhere we just have to pick the right one so we have mm -hmm. to teach people how to select the information they really want to consume mm -hmm. and because you can't consume everything so yes. this is one thing 
Yeah. Definitely. So, so we that have, is the really teaching thing of that important thing. And it's linked to, first of all, that decision. So let's maybe go back to that, that first decision of who you want to be. So that decision, as you said, design your personality. And could you just give the viewers a glimpse in, so what would the next step be then? Because we were outlining to them, okay, so first thing is that decision, who do I want to be? I, I start to be aware of who am I now? And then what is next? Then what do I decide on next? Yes, then we have to introduce a little bit of the concept of emotions because um, most personalities, as I said, are based on the past. So the process of change implies mm. to break habits, to break old habits. Sometimes we, we tend to associate habits with, uh, you, you know, with eating habits, but we also have emotional habits. Yes. So there are, yeah. there are and, and the, what is the habit? It's something we think we cannot... Uh, uh, it's something that we have conditioned that is that we have created through repetition. To break a habit means also to break that continuity between thought and feeling and, and action. Now we are the problem with habits that we are addicted to the chocolate, mm. we are addicted to the cigarette, and we are addicted to the emotions. Mm -hmm. And maybe we have observed that some people are addicted to conflict, to conflict, to uh, to um to anger, to adrenaline. So they always have to create conflict wherever they go. Because they need that kick. This is one that of gives the... them a certain emotion that for them actually does them good. <laughs> exactly. And they insane. use the environment. Yeah. They, they use the environment, the people in their life to to make that emotion alive for them because then they feel something. So the point is, okay, we need to become aware that we are addicted to that emotions. So how, how do we change? How do we we want if we don't want to be that way anymore? So mm -hmm. how do we change? So the first thing is to have the intention in head. Mm -hmm. We have the plan. We have we want to go to the gym. And the second one is really to start acting like that person. So one of the things that we can do with our brain is to imagine the future. Mm -hmm. And this is, again, a function of the frontal lobe of the CEO. Yes. So you can sit down and we do this all the time right away. Imagine you're booking your vacation. So before you book, oh, yes. you may you may sit and you may think, oh, I see myself already on the beach with my cocktail. So you're already imagining yourself. The next thing you do, you go to internet, you book your flight, you book your hotel. So the intention, the thought precedes the action, but you're already imagining. So for for changing habits, it's the same process. The point is, is they are not that comfortable always. So yeah, especially at the beginning. So that first step might be the most, uh, the hardest one. But so what you're saying is, so first of all, is to envision your new identity, then to envision your new, how you're going to act. So in, let's go back to the nice example of the New Year's resolution, doing more sport. So I'm going to envision myself uh, every Monday, I'm going to go to the gym, for example. And I can I also envision myself to feel good about it. <laughs> absolutely so I, I would recommend to do it every day and uh, so you just sit for five minutes every day and you imagine yourself you are losing weight you have more energy you have more power you can buy new things you're more happy you're more you can focus more at work so you start rehearsing that mentally oh, so you that's... rehearse mentally what happens in your brain when you do this? And you start already connecting to positive emotion. Mm -hmm. This is an important point. It is not enough to think positively about yourself, about the future. It requires also to feel exactly that way. Why? We have been saying that we need to change the personality. We need to change Thoughts, actions, and feelings. So we need to align the new thought to a new emotion, to a new action. And that's why we need to, at the beginning, we need to rehearse that. We need to feel, simulate the emotion. Simulate so the emotion, imagine. yeah. That's, it sounds so easy, simulate. but that's the important part. It's it's actually really putting you in, in your mind, like putting you in that state and like imagining, okay, next Monday, and I'm going to go, I'm going to be feeling great. You know, that it's actually a mental, it's it's really mental work, isn't it? You need it to, is. because That's imagining a feeling is not that easy. 
No, but you can you can just imagine uh, uh, a similar experience that you had when you succeed, succeed mm -hmm. a change, a challenge you master, and how you felt about it. So you can you can recreate the emotion because every memory we have, there is normally an emotion associated with that. Emotions That's play an, an important role in memory building. So the moment you recall that memory, the emotion comes very quick. So and you can use this if it's hard for you to feel that emotion. The important thing is that positive thinking alone is not enough. Mm -hmm. You need to feel that way. Positive also. feeling, yeah. So this it's is very positive thinking just... and positive feeling, yeah. Yeah, positive because what you just said also is 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 very, very powerful. It actually means that when we, you know. We all know this this practice of having uh, positive affirmations to ourselves. Uh, for example, to to let's go back to your example in the morning when we take five minutes to imagine the day, to prioritize, to also ask us how we feel. So we do positive affirmations, maybe also uh, also in meditation that is used. But then what you're saying is we also need to practice positive feeling when we think about the future, and that is a next level for me. That is really a next level because it, it 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 actually acknowledges that emotions and what you said before that also was so powerful. Emotions, they create memory, but they also create the future. So emotions is something that is guiding our brain, but it's actually true. When we think of our past in situations where we felt nothing, we don't remember that because it didn't make a difference to our life. But, you know, uh, the most Uh, memorized moments in our lives are usually the ones that had the strongest feelings so actually our brain is totally facilitated by emotions is it fair yes. to say that and, and, yes and you know what uh, most americans can remember what we were what they were doing on on, on 9 11 ah yes because it, cut in <laughs> it was so, so much triggering all emotions yeah but they can remember the day before they cannot remember yeah so, This is significant. And and uh, the point is um, also, of course, we need to to do something about it. and it costs effort and it takes some time to break the habit and to create a new habit of making sports three times a week, for example. Yes. It takes between 21 days and 264, I think, a different okay. st one, one study. Depends on the habit, depends how much you have been doing that depends on how ingrained is that habit so you cannot mm -hmm. say that it's only three weeks uh, you have to the point is you have to repeat consistently over time and one interesting thing that studies show is that when you do that mental rehearsal mm -hmm. um, the same areas in your brain are activated as when you remember so when you build memories for something past Let's say you had an experience yesterday, you build a memory in the hippocampus. This is the memory center. So they are the same areas in the hippocampus are activated when you are simulating the future. Mm -hmm. so, so you create a kind of memory of the future. So memory of something that didn't happen yet, which is wow. uh, amazing. So, and this is happening in your brain. So means... Absolutely. And sometimes subconsciously, right? Because what you're just describing, I can confirm from my own experience. If I create these positive memories for the future, I know the day is going to be good. Apart from if there's things happening that, you know, I can't influence like X, Y, Z. But like, it's really, it's really true. How we create our future in our head with our feelings, usually there is a high likelihood that it actually happens that way. Yes. Yeah, of course, we start making it more possible for us. So, and the more mm -hmm. we think about the future, the more uh, hardwired uh, is the connection. So we create that because of the neuroplasticity, we create a circuit associated with that future we are design, de desiring. We are pruning the old future that is not going to the gym. So we're pruning that connections, we're creating the new ones. And in uh, in six months, we don't even think about not going. It's just automatic. We have created a new habit. And, and the habit has become possible. As you, I want to use your words, it makes it possible through that practice, actually. That is powerful as well. Because so what you're saying is on the on the flip side of it, it's we are our own enemy. So if things don't become possible <laughs> in our lives, if they don't happen, like the gym, it, it means because we have not made them possible in our head. Yes, we don't believe it is possible. Yes. Yeah. That's why that's, that's why, why it doesn't why... happen. <laughs>
and yeah, we can't blame others that. for it we can't say oh no it's because my husband he's he's not letting me go no <laughs> it's because we haven't had the mental i want to use your words the positive feeling the creating memories of the future we didn't do that that's why yes exactly and you say it's so wonderfully and the the, the thing is that we, we all know already how to do how to do it because everybody has done some great changes in their lives mm-hmm. yes just and have we, are to, we activate <laughs> that, that knowledge that wisdom that capacity and this is just the way uh what, what neurogen solutions does is a, a, a model which is consistent with offers a process of repetition for one month after the program so that we really help people to change that habits that they have chosen to make uh, so that after one month, this habit is of thinking, uh, 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 feeling, and acting is already ingrained, and, mm. and this, this is the way we are designed. I call it the inner technology. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we are so uh, you are so focused so much in the technology outside, but what about understanding why? Oh inner yes, technology? our own how our body functions in terms of our thoughts, our how the thoughts create the feelings, as you outlined wonderfully how the thoughts create the actions. And the feeling is actually what I learned from you now is that the feeling creates more thoughts than actually the other way around. We always think, you know, through the past, how we were programmed to believe that science works. We were programmed to believe that our thought is stronger than the feelings. I don't think so now. No, you know, they are, there's no yeah. there's no hierarchy. It's actually, no. it's an intertwined uh, functioning, right? It is, they, they influence each other all the time. Mm. Um, I give you the example. We start thinking about, uh, let's say somebody says, I am overworked and I uh, have one meeting mm-hmm. after the other. So you start having those thoughts. And when you have enough thoughts, your brain creates some brain chemicals. And some of those chemicals travel down to the body because the body oh. and the brain are yeah, talking to it. each other. And, and then, then we you overworked. Have, you have an adrenaline, you get angry. The mo- and this the emotion, the adrenaline is what creates the emotion, mm-hmm. not the thought. It is the emotion that creates the change in the body. So you start feeling angry. Why? Because you have an adrenaline release. Yeah. So the moment you start feeling angry, there is a signal from the body to the brain, and you start thinking, I am angry. So you start creating thoughts like everybody's an idiot here, for example, which <laughs> are not true, not true but they are corresponding exactly how you feel. So there is a continuity between thought and feeling. You create a thinking and feeling loop, but a negative one. And this is how you create that habit of thinking and feeling because you continue thinking and feeling and creating those chemicals since 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. Yeah, and it creates, it, it, it kind of is self um, perpetuating, right? It creates a vicious yeah. circle. It creates stronger and stronger. So there might be a situation really where people have a lot of work, okay? But the way in which you feel about it and go throughout the day might be reinforced by yourself, right? It might make it stronger or like worse. And actually, it's not that bad kind of thing in reality. Well, now we get into the question, is there a real reality? That's a different story. (laughs) But like, you know what I mean? I think if I understand you correctly, you just outlined that that it creates this kind of self perpetuating circle, right? Yes. And and this is uh, this is one thing I mean, really make things worse as they are, because, of course, we have all a lot of stress and we are in a VUCA world and we have to change and, and uh, there's constant demands for attention. This is one thing. But um, our thoughts create a stress also. Mm-hmm. We are preoccupating it's about so many things. We're imagining worst case scenarios. Yeah, yes. It may yeah. not happen, may not happen. And because of that, we are, we are creating stress just by thought alone. And this is why. What do you. Thing. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. No, no. no. I, uh, I just wanted to say because what you just said might uh, be very important for many viewers, uh, including me, <laughs> in terms of what do you advise people who in the current times experience a lot of fear? Uh, I'm experimenting with that at the moment. I, I try to completely pivot whenever I have anxious thoughts that I kind of interrupt myself. I go out in nature to not have these anxious thoughts because I feel they just come from myself. Especially now after having listened to you, I feel even more they come from myself. But how, what do you advise people with lots of anxious, anxious uh, anxiety? What do you say to them? Is it true that it that it can be interrupted? Yes, I would start with, it uh, depends on the level of anxiety, what is the reason why, but I would stop that thought, I would try to prune that thought, every time it that thought appears, just say to yourself, stop, 
stop stop that mm -hmm. thought wow. and because every time you say stop you're you're pruning that connection in time mm -hmm. you disappear of course you can make breathing exercises you can uh um, um, connect to a positive memory so that, mm -hmm. that you start rewiring your brain to a more positive uh, uh, tone, to more positive uh, thoughts. So you can start also imagining your future. But one of the immediate tools is to say every time this thought is coming, uh, one thing that really helps is just because you have a thought, it doesn't have to be true. Yeah. That is important. Don't believe, in, don't believe yeah. in your thoughts. They are just creations of your mind. And only if it helps, you can keep them. But uh, one of the things that I think we need to learn is also to control mm. which thoughts do, do we allow. Ah, yes. What do we believe in exactly? That is very, very, very important, especially if we talk now about our thoughts about others. You know, going back to the introductory thing about diversity, uh, if we think about others, we tend to have that as well when we, you know, um, the theory of prejudice. Where does prejudice come from? Mostly from our own thinking, from our own heads about others. So also for that, it is important to stop it sometimes because we tend to believe our predisposed perception of others. We tend to believe that, yeah, all French people are like that. Nonsense. <laughs> you know, we, we need to stop these thoughts as well because they create prejudice. Absolutely, absolutely. And and okay, we cannot really be totally free because uh we have these collective biases that, yeah, they are. that are uh, by design is part of the way how we process information. So yeah. they are kind of filters for our brain. And then and there's the work of, of Kahneman and Tuesky um mm. on uh, uh, novel price. Cognitive bias, yeah. Exactly. So if you have a brain, we are biased. This is how the neural leadership uh, says mm -hmm. that. So we can we cannot really eliminate bias. So this is a part of how we operate. Otherwise, we couldn't survive. We couldn't filter all the amounts of information. Yeah. Too much information, otherwise. Yeah. This is one yeah. thing. However, we can train ourselves um, specific strategies for different kinds of biases, such so that we are more vigilant. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, for decision making, um, that we are really uh, more and more vigilant, that we don't uh, make important mistakes. We cannot, you really cannot make uh, control bias in all situations in, in your life. But mm -hmm. if you know you have to make an important decision or you have to go to a meeting where there are different people and they all have different backgrounds, you can prepare yourself to listen more attentively, for example, to pay attention to the body language, um, to ask uh, before you make any conclusions, uh, to ask yourself, does this thought I'm having really true? Do I have some facts mm -hmm. about it? There are some ways that you can mitigate the effect on that on that bias. And I think this will also play a more important role in the next years. It's That's also a future skill, definitely. I would like to join you on that. And what you said as well, I think what you just described is nice because it, it describes that first step uh, we have to accept that we have these cognitive biases but we can be aware that we have them and just the knowledge that we have them as human beings already is a first step to see okay i might be biased here okay let's hang on let's ask the person another question to understand better you know that already helps because it gives you a different perspective perception and it gives you that humility as well to realize okay i'm just another human being who might be completely wrong in what i assume this is, I mean, you you say the word humility, and this is uh, uh, this is a so called blind spot bias that mm -hmm. says that blind everybody bias, bias yeah. but not me. Yeah. <laughs> so this is, the, the, this is uh, the king of the biases, and if you have already awareness about this bias, you have way you have done your halfway on bias yeah. mitigation because we you, lack yeah. humility. Yeah. Absolutely. And if you said before about how we educate uh, maybe from an early age, uh, young humans, uh, I think that should be a skill as well to be more focused on what are, as you said, the inter I like I like your way of, of referring to the internal technology to teach maybe children already how human the human wiring, the human brain functions in order to understand that there are certain limitations of our functioning as well. We are not superhumans. We are not these kind of robots <laughs> that can exclude that we 
that we perceive things in a way that is just coming from our perspe perception. We cannot avoid that. So I think to teach children that awareness would be a huge step, really. This is one thing. And I also think in the future, emotional intelligence, empathy, mm -hmm. um, will be very highly demanded to really uh, connect with other people, to really try to understand other people and develop uh, strategies to be more empathetic with others and compassion, develop compassion. compassion so they, yes. they, they gen genuine wish to help others, to help people in need. Uh, because at the end, um, we are all here in teamwork. So there is nothing yeah. really that can be done only by one person. We are We're never a single human on the planet, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, so that we definitely, to, we yeah. We're thinking that way, yeah. And actually, the, the recent debate about how now artificial intelligence will fit into our new world, actually, I can see a, a nice way of how the two intelligences, the artificial intelligence and the human intelligence, how they can uh, actually help each other. You know, we can always be assisted by the artificial intelligence, but in our empathy, because I believe like you, empathy will, I don't think that any robot will learn how to be compassionate or how to have these feelings of, of of caring for another person but the the artificial intelligence can maybe assist us in being more compassionate in in terms of um, making us aware uh, of certain things that are going on you know yes that well, is I'm, my thought. I'm not an expert uh, yet i think it will evolve of course there are robots that are able to recognize emotions in faces but i think this is still very limited because we are very complex beings yeah we yeah have we also we also perceive information from the environment we sense other people you enter in a room and you sense if there is a bad atmosphere or yeah. not if the people are in a mood even even though not nobody said a word so i don't know mm -hmm. if a robot is able to know that the things in the environment so there are that many is the things interesting still like question will any robot ever be you know aware of these kind of um it's kind of like waves how would you how would you say you have such a great vocabulary of describing that. How would you describe that when you come into a room and you sense something? Yes. What would you say is that? It's a kind of intuition. This is a intuition, kind of intuition, right? Yeah. yeah. And this is um, um, a part of one other program I have, which is um, the coherence and the resilience advantage from the Heart Math Institute. And they are being researching for, I think, 25 to 30 years mm -hmm. about the, uh, the magnetic field of the heart. Right. So, yeah, and and there is, uh, you know, the heart it produces electricity because you can mm -hmm. measure it with the electrocardiogram. So everybody, when you go to the doctor and you make an electrocardiogram, it measures electricity. So and when you have an electrical field, you also have a magnetic field, and you can measure mm -hmm. magnetic fields with a magnetogram. So what has been measured is uh, that we have a magnetic field which is about one meter, um, um, about um, ah, around us. On the body, yes, yeah. and you can measure this. And the point is, your emotions are being carried in in the the way your heart beats, and the emotions are uh, can be measured in the magnetic field uh, uh, of your heart. So it means, and we have in the program one chart, two charts of two different emotions. I think mm -hmm. one positive and one negative, and you see that the um, that the graph, the, which is called the spectral analysis, is different for different emotions. It means this magnetic field is like a real wave for emotions. Right. So in, in, in a practical example, when you feel joy, you are mm -hmm. carrying that joy, not only in your body, but in your magnetic field, and the people that are interacting with you. And they can see that. And you exactly. energize the people, but also the opposite. Now, if somebody is complaining all the time and you, and you interact with that person, uh, he's having this emotional signature in the magnetic field. You're interfering. Your field is interfering with the field of the other person. Yes. And you're taking that emotion with you. So, and that's why we feel depleted um, after interacting with that person. So there's still a lot of research um, uh, to be done, but this is one explanation. Mm -hmm. And I believe, to some extent, it will be it will be possible if you can measure it and you can program it somehow in the future. But this is oh, only that's one. Very interesting. Yeah, it is. And the point is, and I wanted to go back because emotions, negative emotions, um, are are playing an important role uh, in the ability to change. 
uh, because when we have negative emotions, what happens is physiologically, there is a signal from the body, mm -hmm. especially from the heart to the brain. And uh, what happens is the brain becomes very incoherent. Oh, so right. me yeah. incoherent yeah. means the different compartments mm -hmm. of the brain stop communicating with each other. Yeah. And especially the frontal lobe, the CEO, once again, is the mm -hmm. first one that goes offline, meaning... Yeah, because it doesn't, it, as you say, it's not coherent, so it doesn't compute. So and, there's... Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And that's the reason why when you get, um, let's say, somebody did something to you, you reacted to that person. Mm -hmm. Emotionally, you said something, you wrote something, uh, you were incoherent that moment, but in the, in the afternoon, in the evening, or the next day, you are thinking... I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. Mm -hmm. So you would have have a different response. Then you are coherent again, and then you mm -hmm. see what have been a different, better response. So that's why it's so important to regulate our emotions when we are in stress, because our yeah. brain becomes very incoherent. And it's not that's computing. I mean, it's it's not computing anymore because the brain, as you said, um, can only function when it's aligned with our feelings. And then that again has to be aligned with the actions, and that that actually it, it actually explains what you just said. Also, why we should always be in a flowing or like calm state before we respond to people that maybe trigger us or something. We should never respond out of anger or like because something creates a reaction that maybe is linked to the past. We shouldn't do that because it creates that out of balance reactions that we yeah, make. And, uh, yeah, and, run, <laughs> and, and you know, wrong decisions also, a lot of problems, delays and and, yeah. and, and relationship problems. So that's at the, the point is, can you catch yourself in the moment and regulate mm -hmm. your emotions? Because your brain is blocked. You cannot, you're in a narrow focus. You're in a, in a reactive state. So and maybe as a... Sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry. I didn't want to interrupt you, but this is so, so fascinating what you're saying. But maybe to the viewers who can completely relate to those situations now, as a final note, because I'm also, I want to respect yes. your time, obviously, as a final note, what would you say to them when they find themselves very often in these kind of quick reactions? What can they do to 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 then say when they realize, oh God, I'm, I'm, I'm just reacting again? What could they say to the other person? Um, I mean, myself, I would perhaps say, can we take a break now? Or could I just, you know, could I demand some reflection time? Or what, what would you, you know, because we are in a situation with other people. And sometimes also the, I feel many times we feel the others are expecting a reaction, but it might not be the case, right? I would suggest if it's possible to make a five minutes break. If, if Break, you, yeah. If you can, if you're not alone, to have a five minute break, go to the, take some fresh air, breathe mm -hmm. a couple of minutes. One thing is uh, to calm your nervous system, just breathe in and you can't count from one to five slowly, try to breathe a little bit deeper and slower than, than usual. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then you breathe out, also counting from one to five. This is already stopping that energy drain of this negative emotion mm -hmm. this is already changing your physiology because uh, and this is still blocking here your your uh your mental uh, your brain your brain yeah. is contracted right now your brain cannot cannot seek solutions cannot yeah. have a, that's a broad focus so this is one thing that can help when the, the situation escalates so a first way to cool down yeah mm -hmm. and and the best thing is, of course, if you practice it every day, because you are tra then you're training your body and it knows how to change to a positive emotion when it's critical. The practice, so as you said, we need to get going to have these experiences and simply try it, right? Because if we never practice it, we, we will not be able to do that. Even that, even asking for a break in a difficult situation has to be practiced because the more we are routined in it, because we 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 observe ourselves, the better it gets. I think, yeah, definitely. We, so we want... thank you, yes. thank you for that. Because I think a lot of people can relate to that. We all have these difficult moments, and uh, thank you so much for all these fascinating explications. I'm just for the viewers as well. I'm going to link in obviously how they can get in touch with you because your perspective and uh, the neural change solutions perspective, especially, can be very helpful for many many viewers can be useful, as you said, for organizations, but also individuals. And it's something, it's really a work on yourself, as you said, 
for your identity, for your uh, realization of how you yourself as a human are wired, how you work. And I can just recommend, I think for me, even today, just in this interview, I've learned so much. Um, is there something that you would like to add maybe also for, as a final note for the viewers who say, okay, I want to, I want to go on that journey. I want to perceive myself more, how my brain works. What would you maybe say, recommend to those? What is the first step they can do? What is the first little step they can do maybe tomorrow to start thinking in that way? Yeah, they can start thinking maybe, um, how do I want to feel today? Um, we start the day usually with a to-do list and we need to do this and that tomorrow and we just drink our coffee and jump into the first activity. But what about starting uh, being uh, taking the command of your life by deciding how you want to feel independent of what happens during the day, independent of the conditions of your environment? Mm would be a good practice and also remember through the day that you decided to feel gratitude today grateful today so and yes. when you're not being grateful go back to gratitude what am i grateful for how want, how do i want to feel today that is a very powerful question and what do i want to live today you know it's a life it's not just a thinking it's also a life as you said actions feelings and thoughts not just thoughts and i think it's it was very powerful all your suggestions all your explanations thank you so much maria luisa for this uh, very very good interview i'm gonna link in all the recommendations and of course the website to your uh, to your company thank, thank you so very much, much.